Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Mohammed Mohammed. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Uh, and it's a pleasure, as always, to welcome you here on behalf of our board of directors and our staff. And also welcome to our online audience. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Ibtissam Barakat, who will be speaking about her book, Balcony on the Moon, Coming of Age in Palestine. Uh, Ibtissam's new and intense memoir details her life as she came of age in Palestine from 1972 to 1981, which was a politically turbulent time in Palestine's history in particular, and in Middle Eastern history in, in general. The book explores several timely and important themes, including human rights and equality, the costs of wars and unresolved racial strife, and the necessity of education for girls worldwide. Balcony on the Moon is the companion to Barakat's groundbreaking and critically acclaimed earlier memoir, which was called Tasting the Sky, A Palestinian Childhood. Ibtissam Barakat is a Palestinian-American poet, translator, artist, educator, and an award-winning author in both English and Arabic. She is a human rights advocate whose work focuses on healing social injustices and the hurts of wars, especially those involving young people. She has taught uh, language ethics and creative writing at Stevens College. She is the founder of Write Your Life Seminars to help people negotiate their life stories and contribute to composing a book of light, uh, life excuse me, that includes everyone's perspectives. Ibtissam's books include the critically acclaimed memoirs, again, Tasting the Sky, uh, which won several Best Book Awards and Balcony on the Moon, uh, which has received numerous honors and is currently on the short list for the Palestine Book Award. Both memoirs accompany the reader into the world of a Palestinian family from the perspective of a young person. Her writings also appeared in publications including The Nation, The Washington Post, Amnesty International Books, World Literature Today magazine, Bookbird, and others. An international speaker, she has addressed audiences at venues including the Kennedy Center uh, for the Performing Arts down the street, uh, the Margaret Mitchell House and Museum, the Faulkner Word and Music Festival, and the Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta. She has visited a large number of schools and learning communities. She was a delegate to the UN Third Conference on Ending Racism, and has performed as a judge in the nat uh, National Finals of Poetry Out Loud competitions organized by the NEA and the Poetry Foundation. Uh, and just so you know, uh, Ibtissam also has a TED Talk about her relationship with language, which you can find through our website uh, from her page. And of course, copies of Balcony on the Moon and Tasting the Sky will be available for purchase after today's event. So please uh, grab a copy on your way out. Uh, Ibtissam will speak for 30 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, we just ask during the Q&A session if you could wait till the mic comes to you so that everybody here and online can hear you. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ibtissam Barakat. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to me uh, speak uh, about my new book, uh, Balcony on the Moon. It's a memoir. And I want to thank the Jerusalem Fund, the Palestine Center, everyone who works here, everyone who's worked here and contributed to building this center so that it is um, a venue where the Palestinian voice is heard. Actually, I uh, was invited first by uh, Zaina uh, to the center, and then I worked with Samira and everyone, and uh, Sima, uh, and I'm so delighted to uh, meet them and you. Uh, Balcony on the Moon is, uh, just like uh, Mohammed mentioned, it's actually a memoir of me coming of age in Palestine. It's the companion for Tasting the Sky, which I wrote about my childhood years in Palestine after the Six Day War and then four years after the Six Day War. It's pretty much the only book that um, explores and chronicles as a piece of history, uh, personal history, what happened to a child who uh, was present at that war and then 
uh, we became homeless for four months and 13 days uh, from shelter to shelter. Then when we went back to Palestine, we became homeless in our homeland. I grew up as a person who had no rights whatsoever, not just no voting, but um, uh, the soldiers came to our schools. Uh, they raided our homes at 1.30 a.m. Uh, to search for books about Palestine, for instance, to search for activists. I, I grew up not being able to say the word Palestine. Uh, if you said the word Palestine, you would be taken to jail for six months. Um, if the army uh, searched your notebooks and found that you've drawn a flag, a Palestinian flag, then you were arrested. Um, the best I knew about my history were fragments of words written on graffiti on the walls, like um, this day is, you know, uh, during this day this happened in the past, or uh, um, 67 something about it, or uh, a quotation from a leader. Zero about my history. In the schools they taught us, I went to a United Nations school um, for the uh, children of refugees, UNRWA, and they taught us zero about Palestine. Like I finished a 12th grade knowing nothing about Palestine. If I could have some water, that'd be great. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much. And um, uh, without history, a person cannot make decisions about who, we are, who they are. I didn't know myself. Um, my parents couldn't tell me about themselves either. My mom was four years old during 1948. And um, when the Israeli troops, or like the Jewish troops at that time, before Israel was uh, a nation, um, they are coming through her village, and uh, everyone ran away, and they left her behind. She was left, she was asleep, and they left her behind. My grandpa and my grandma and everyone in the village, they emptied the village, and they left her behind. Uh, they reached Jerusalem after um, eight hours of walking and running, like the entered into Jerusalem, and thank you. <coughs> if you knew Arabic, you know that these stories binashfuri. That's the expression in Arabic that you really you really need water when you talk about these things. Um, uh, so uh, they reached. Uh, Jerusalem, and then they discovered that my mom was not with them. So my grandpa walked back and ran back to their village along the coast of Palestine at that time, and he found her and then brought her back eight more hours, and they joined the family. But to have a child who became my mother, to have a child left alone uh, during um, um, I guess I cry sometimes, okay. Um, no, I think the silence is part of my voice where um, words have not been articulated, where um, it's a place where words haven't grown yet, and that's that. Um, so sometimes there's silence, and sometimes there are tears, and sometimes they are words. And I cannot pretend that my voice has only words, and my Palestinian voice. And so um, the fact that a child, uh, age three or four, uh, was left there by herself with all the shooting and the explosions and the definitely killing of people around her uh, 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 destroyed my mother's childhood. This is being streamed online, um, and that's who I am as a Palestinian. I'll speak that way. And uh, later on, in 1967, my, my mom, uh, she gave birth to me, and she was 19 uh, years old. And um, she raised me with all the brokenness of her world. And she brought that with her to uh, bringing me up. My dad brought something else. Uh, my dad is uh, 20 years uh, older than my mom, and he um, lived the 1936, what's uh, called the Great Arab Revolution. I don't know how great 
how great any war is, but it was a big uh, Arab revolution. Uh, England was ruling over Palestine at that time, and um, England was facilitating the arrival of many Jewish people from the Holocaust to Palestine without telling the Palestinians. Of course, Palestine was colonized, so they controlled uh, after the ending of the First World War and the destruction or defeat of the Ottoman Empire, uh, France and England controlled the majority of the Middle East and Africa, and um, they ran these people's lives uh, pretty much in every detail. Um, and when it came to Palestine, the um, Jewish people leaders agreed with the British leaders. Uh, one of the documents is Balfour Declaration uh, to have Palestine as a Jewish home. And when the Palestinians felt that the land is uh, being um, turned into something other than what they knew, they really still didn't understand what was happening. They revolted, and the British killed 5,000 people and imprisoned 10,000 people. And my dad uh, saw that, lived that, remembered that. Uh, and uh, he was affected greatly also by the British mandate or the British rule over Palestine by the fact that Britain was trying to maintain a situation of illiteracy for the Palestinians so that Jewish people would be more educated and the Palestinians less educated and therefore they could be dominated. You understand that slavery wouldn't exist without the inexistence, uh, without the um, inequality in education what to do, how to use your mind, how to use your life, how to use your history, how to read yourself, how to read the world. So an inequality needed to be created in order to dominate the Palestinians. And uh, so what they did is um, they made the fees for elementary education extremely high for the families. So my dad could only finish the first grade, first and a half. His family uh, couldn't afford sending him and his brother and his sisters to a school at that time. And it was during the Depression time. You're talking about the 30s, 1936 to 1939. And um, the Depression in Europe, for instance, how it was handled is by the European countries were taking out all of the resources from their colonies, sending them to Europe. And so the people almost starved, including my dad and his family. So that was this giant wound in his psyche then 1948, with the taking of Palestine, that was another wound in my father's psyche. And these two stories of my mom and my dad met, and they would create my story and the story of my siblings. And we would move forward with this history entirely unnegotiated. The wounds entirely unhealed, the history entirely not understood, not put in context, just a giant land of broken history, broken stories, and people doing anything they can to cope with this history on a daily basis. Uh, what they did is a lot of denial, a lot of please forget, please don't talk about this, please don't ask me this. And they got very angry when I asked them about what happened to them, their history, asking my mom, so please tell me more about when they left you behind. Like, you know, what person wants to t tell you more and with details? Um, so I, I didn't understand their resistance to um, tell their stories completely. Of course, later on, I understood that when my life gave me the Palestinian details of so many wounds that it would be extremely difficult for me to go back to in order to think, to feel, and to write. So I grew up under Israeli uh, occupation. Um, I was three years old during the Six-Day War. And uh, what happened is there was bombing. The planes were seeding the ground outside of our house. And th we had no electricity at that time. And the June 5th was started on a pitch dark night. They chose June 5th. If you go through the perpetual calendar to see where the moon was, which I went to see, uh, there was zero moon. When the moon had ended, before a new moon had started, they took that moment in time. It was the darkest as far as uh, light and started the war. I could not put on my shoes. My mom said, put on your shoes. I couldn't put on my shoes. I was three years old, uh, didn't have enough motor skill, I guess, to work in the dark. And my family left, and they left me behind, exactly like what happened to my mom. Uh, for a whole night, I, trying, I was trying to make decisions as though I was an army general 
what to do to negotiate war and to survive. And in the morning, I found them, but that had changed me. That had changed me in ways that I possibly will never understand. It changed how I attach to things, how I leave things, how I relate to places, how I relate to people. Uh, one lucky thing is that uh, I, at a war shelter, I met Aleph, the first letter of the Arabic alphabet, and Aleph, who looked like a stick, and then eventually he would look like a pen, became my best friend. And Aleph would introduce me to the rest of the alphabet, and a pen became the companion of my life. Um, sometimes I see it as a musical instrument, a string without the instrument, all of life is the body of the musical instrument, and this is one string, as though like it's a rabab, if you know the rabab. Sometimes I see it as a bridge between two places. Sometimes it's as a pillow, I sleep on it. Sometimes it's a, my microphone when I want to speak. And when uh, I was in Palestine and the uh, children threw stones at the soldiers, I wanted to throw a pen and have it write everything on the sky. It would be filled with my voice and my stories, and it would write everything on the sky, as opposed to a stone that possibly would say nothing. And I also was wondering why Palestinians didn't write things on the stones before they threw them. I felt like, you know, uh, the stone is just a stone, but if you write what you want to be said on the stone, it would become... Uh, a document, and then the soldiers would actually pick up these stones and read them. That's what we needed to do, but they didn't. Uh, so I grew up under Israeli occupation. Uh, the, the expression grew up is wrong because up was not possible for me. I grew down, I grew sideways, I tried to grow. Uh, the uh, legacy of the Israeli occupation on my life is um, not just my life. By the way, as I speak, I'm not just speaking about myself. I am one cell in this body. I am one member in this giant society that's called the Palestinian people, but also the Arabs and the Middle East and all of humanity. I do acknowledge that what is happening to the Palestinians right now has happened to many people and is happening to other people in different contexts. Uh, but the, the particularity of, us, of our story is that it's denied. People are denying that it's happening. So there aren't true efforts to resolve it. There's a shutting of our voice. There's a dimming of our story. There is this hostility toward the Palestinian voice when the Palestinian voice begins to speak with honesty. The legacy of the Israeli occupation on my life has uh, several um, elements or threads, many, but I'm just going to outline a few of them. One of them is silence. I could not speak. I could not express. I practiced silence. Immense things would happen in front of me, like people getting hurt, like I'm getting hurt. My response was silence, because if I spoke, I would be punished. Another element is dishonesty. We became deeply dishonest in order to survive. I feel like I want to do something, but I act like I don't. I'm outraged at a checkpoint, but I act like everything is okay with me. People insult me, and all of my humanity wants to do something, but I just walk away like it's normal. This amount of dishonesty that was forced on us in order to survive doesn't go away. It's like muscles have been trained that my mind wants something and my body does something else. It's been trained for 20 years. Other people, they've been trained like this for 50 years for all their lives. So this disconnect between my mind and my body and my emotions, this is the true divide and conquer, as I understand it, that I am conquered 
that my whole self is not mine anymore. The communication between my mind and my body and my emotions and my goals and my history absent. And therefore, I'm a paralyzed human being. And I'm left alone to deal with this without any help, without any acknowledgement that this happens. I have to sit by myself and figure this out on my own. Whole countries work on breaking me up as a human being, and I have to figure this out on my own in the evening after I watch the news and act like a normal Palestinian human being who wants peace, who can actually do peace. Another element of this legacy of, um, which I call it a Holocaust-informed occupation, because the people actually who are carrying out the uh, policies are people who have gone through the Holocaust, the majority of the leaders, and these are the methods that they use. There's, they're not inventing things, they're just taking what they know from the bag of history that has been directed at them, wounded them, and they know how effective that is, and they work it on us. What I see happened in my life is something I call a shift between responsibility, that's what a child is supposed to be taught, responsibility, and as a writer, as a words person, I understand responsibility as response ability. The ability to respond is a respond ability, which is responsibility, okay? So I was moved between response ability to response disability. The occupation's job is to disable me from responding to my life. So you have a whole population of people who are disabled from responding. The people in Gaza living in, inside, um, I mean, it's, it's definitely a concentration camp, and this is streaming live, and I'm telling the world it's a concentration camp, and please go check. Don't take my word for it. Just go check. I was listening to a French philosopher, and he said the first time they knew about the concentration camps, um, it was when some Jewish people escaped from them and went to France and began to tell, to say, we saw this, this is happening to us, please believe us. And that's what the Palestinians who carry the Palestinian story are doing. We're trying to say, we saw this, this happened to us, please believe us. Just go see. We're not making this up. We don't wish for this to be happening. We're not inventing this because it feels good to invent that this is happening to your people. This is happening to us. And any psychologist doesn't have to go there can tell you that when people get harmed, wounded, unless there's intervention, they do what was done to them, to other people. This is standard, even parents. It's not like another nation coming to do it to, to you. It's uh, parents do that. My mom was left behind in the war and somehow she left me. Could I conclude she was wounded in that area? So we were moved to this place of disability. The human Palestinian child is trained into disability. There's something in the literature, the human development literature called learned helplessness. You are, you are taught to act as helpless for your survival, and therefore it becomes a, a strong response for you. Women know that. All women know that. We're taught to behave in a certain way that is helpless, so we can keep our jobs, so we can keep our partners, so we can keep whatever it is that we need to keep. I do believe, as a person who's thinking all the time uh, about these issues from a human perspective, I do believe that the oppression that's imposed from nation to nation is modeled on the oppression that men have directed at women. Half of the population toward the other half enslaved them for centuries. The very same tools keep them uneducated, keep them within a wall, that happened to be the house, whatever it is, the wall, keep them inside prevent them from developing their skills and the ability, ability to respond to the world, deprive them of that big experience that they can have in their bag as they respond to life, and they will serve you. 
make their survival depend on your approval and you being pleased, and they will serve you. That story doesn't end here. In what I see, the oppression of men over, or nations over nations, comes from the male over female, and it comes from the adult over the child. This is the crux of what's going on. The adult sees that the child doesn't have skills, cannot make decisions, does not see the big picture, is not developed enough. If we just kept certain populations behaving as children, we run their lives, we give them their allowance, the World Bank or you know whomever, um, they can't defend themselves. It's not acceptable that they def defend themselves or that they be represented in the places where we are represented. The children can't mix with the adults in order not to learn about the adult world, etc. If we can use this model of keeping whole groups as children, then we will maintain that supremacy over them. But the human being wants to grow. Whether it's a child, a woman, uh, a person who belongs to any nation, wants to grow and wants to be equal. And the resistance is to that. The resistance is to equal representation, that what I love is as equally valuable and viable and respectable as what you love. My desire for life is as important as your desire for life. My belonging to my Palestine is as important as your belonging to your Israel. It could be the same thing, but this is my Palestine and it shall always forever be my Palestine. And I'm not changing my word and this is streaming. <laughs> it's my Palestine. You can call it anything you like, but it's my Palestine. This is what I want to call it. You can't impose anything on me. Especially because I have been working for years and years to regain my response ability. That when something happens, I respond as a Palestinian. I don't respond as an occupied Palestinian. I respond as a Palestinian. I'm willing to talk about anything, but I will talk about it as a Palestinian. There are a few things I'd like to uh, bring up as well. And then I'd like to open it up for conversation because conversation is the best thing in the world. Uh, you, would, you would ask me about things you want to hear about and I don't have to predict them. Uh, something about the books. The, since this is Balcony on the Moon and it's about the book, uh, these two books, they're companions. I was not allowed to have my history, actual history. And if you go to any doctor, a doctor wants to have a history of any condition in order to treat it. There is no treating any uh, scientific issue without a history. The knowledge, human people, uh, human, the human mind, people, and knowledge is about history. Now, a being that has history means this being has been acting, has done things in the past, the wall doesn't do things in the past. Even that, we try to study the history of the wall, what happened to it while it's standing here. But a human is always doing things. So one of the qualities of being a human being is that you have a history, you've done things, and they reveal the present moment. Now, with the history of the Palestinians, we were given, number one, a fabricated history, like we weren't there or a deprivation, which means blanks in our history. We're not allowed to study it. Our parents are afraid to actually tell us about their history, what they know, what they've done, because this is not acceptable. And so I come here in this moment with that history. And I decided, very well, I'm going to start writing my own history, just for myself. And I went inward, because my history, just like a seed, a plant and a seed, well, the big plant has the seed in it, and this, the seed actually carries the DNA, the history of this living being. I went inward, and inward I found the biggest destruction that you can think of. Inward I found a Nakba. I closed my eyes and looked inside of me, there was a Nakba just right there, and then a Nakba next to it. I found a prison compound in one room, my childhood. 
sitting there inside the chains of fear and war. Over there is my relationship with Palestine. Over there, my family. Over there, my dreams. Over there, my womanhood. Whatever, all of it, like this prison compound on the inside in different rooms. Over there, my voice. And then I had to make a decision. Just let them go, like many people do. Start drinking, drugging, do whatever, because this is what people do to cope with this amount of loss. Or decide to storm the prison compound and begin freeing room after room. I had to decide which goes first. The number one thing was my ability to feel. When I'm sad, to cry, which was difficult because I had stopped that. I needed to stop that. And then I gave myself permission to grieve, to grieve the Nakba, the Naksa, all the pain that happened in my life, to grieve. So all these mountains of pain that were blocking me from feeling would go away. They're still there, some of them. The glaciers are melting. But what happened is important. What happened is I understood the relationship between feeling and ethical behavior. Because feeling is related to empathy. If you're unable to empathize with someone, you can't be ethical toward them. Often we don't empathize with animals, we're not ethical toward them. We make someone the other, so I really don't understand you, therefore I it's okay for me not to be ethical toward you. But the closer you are to me, and the more I'm able to empathize, it's easier to be ethical. So the emotional connectedness to the history, the emotional connectedness to my life, my emotional connectedness to other human beings is the essence of my ethics. And my emotional connectedness to myself, to what happened to me, is where I would begin to act ethically and responsibly. I'm able to respond. I'm feeling, oh, this is painful. I must do something about it. Oh, this feels good. Okay, this is he healed, healthy. And that really helped me to understand patriarchy in general, where the disabling of feeling in the boys and in the men allows war to happen. They cut off your feelings, you'll be able to go and kill somebody because your empathy has been cut off. If you know them, you see them, you can feel about them, it's impossible to kill them. And this is about patriarchy and war. And here's my relationship with myself. It would be easy for me to kill myself if I did not empathize with myself. And many Palestinians waste their lives through smoking, chain smoking, or doing whatever it is they, they are doing. And some people just die out of despair. And the Arabic word for it is qahir. They die qahir. No one can listen to you. No one wants to listen to you. You cannot listen to yourself because you don't have a tool with which to express yourself. My tool, this thing, this timeless thing that costs like 50 cents has saved my life. And in the writing, in these books, I took this devastated world and began to piece it together to rebuild a Palestine for myself word by word, as though it's pieces of brick or whatever, but every word stood for a city or stood for a person, stood for a cause, stood for a poppy flower, stood for a mountain, stood for the Mediterranean, whatever. And I began to piece this together. And I put in these books so far, whatever I love, the wounds as well, my solutions for these wounds, the characters of my life, my mom, my dad, our neighbors, our relatives, the animals. I recreated Palestine. So now I don't have to go through, really, through the checkpoints and the humiliation and everything to go to Palestine. That has been changed, actually. It's been transformed. I can go to these books. And not only that, I give these to everyone who reads them, who, can, you know, who wants to read them. And other people can go to Palestine. Other people can go to the history as well, because the history is now written from my experience. I don't have to go to your history about what happened during this war and during the 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. I have my experience of that, and I can share that with you. I don't have to come to you begging for what happened. I've gone inside and I found what happened. And it wasn't just a personal, really, a recollections. I've done research like this is, I've read every book, every book that I found related to those moments. 
and talked with many people, my people, other people, Israeli perspective, Jewish perspective, different things, the Arabs who are non-Palestinians, the Americans, just to go around this moment, every moment, and understand it more. Because I was forced to be dishonest to survive, and I want to be honest. So when I make a decision, it really is, um, it really has integrity, my decision between me and myself and my relationship with the world it has integrity. And the word integrity, by the way, it's com it comes from math, where like the integers and then the fractions, the integrity means the wholeness. And I want that wholeness after this world has been broken up in so many ways. I want that wholeness. And the way I bring it whole is through writing. Other artists bring it whole in different media. And every human being probably is striving to toward this uh, wholeness. And I will stop here. Thank you for listening. I'll take questions. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, Dan Lieberman, I'm a writer. Yeah, thank you for your very personal report. It's refreshing to hear a first-hand account rather than second-hand accounts which are filtered. And I sort of want to summarize in my mind what you really said and okay. what I got out of it. I'll use some fancy words. Is that the Palestinians lack ontological security, in which I got definitions. A stable mental state derived from a sense of continuity in one's life. And uh, there's a lot of ways of uh, drawing people physically and mentally. Would you say that this is a planned activity of the Israel government and really amounts to a silent genocide? Yes, yes. It does amount to genocide, that's for sure. I do believe, as a Palestinian who is the recip recipient of this behavior, that the Holocaust has not ended. I personally believe the Holocaust has not ended. It's just a new chapter of it happened in Palestine because the Jewish people, one of the players in the Holocaust, they were the victims at that time, European countries, one of the players of the Holocaust, who were the perpetrators of that, and uh, the United Nations, you know, primarily the European countries, um, they continue to play. It's just a different chapter where the Palestinians and the Middle East is involved and the wounded people the Jewish people in this case continue now to get reparations. The form of reparations that they get is uh, their ability to destroy us and to take our land. It's not the same thing that was happening in Europe exactly, but it's a different chapter. This Holocaust didn't end. The problem that is called the Holocaust hasn't ended. It just changed into a different pro problem for a different people. And I want to open up the uh, cir circle to a lot larger than just Europe and the Holocaust. This is truly a human condition that came to the Germans and before the Germans, somebody else, somebody else since the beginning of time. And you can take it to um, Cain killing Abel, our first, you know, look, our first ancestor, sibling, or whatever, killing his brother out of lack of knowledge, out of um, uncontrolled emotions, out of having been wounded by, like, uh, taken out of heaven, you know, like the being refugee out of heaven, the homelessness that was imposed on Adam and Eve in the story. Everybody responds differently to the story. But it's a story of homelessness and depri deprivation of home that led to what I see from all of the accounts, a dysfunctional family where a brother kills his brother. And then you take this story, because I just want to take it, open it up out of the, the Jews and the Palestinians and Europe and the Holocaust and Palestine. This tidal wave is coming from the beginning of history, and it's a killer wave, and it must be understood this way and stopped. This isn't about the Palestinians. This isn't about the Jews, but it's happening to us. So it has to be resolved and addressed as something that's been happening for a long time, like a disease that's been going on for a long time, and if we're made to accept it, that doesn't end it. Look, the Palestinians say, okay, well, we accept peace, we accept humiliation, the, the way they, they're framing peace. We don't want our home. We can be slaves. That's fine. As though it would solve the problem. It wouldn't. Actually, the most hopeful thing that's happening 
in the world is that the Palestinians are resisting and are refusing to accept this. Not for the Palestinians themselves, for all of humanity. The Palestinians are resisting as a most hopeful thing about humanity, not accepting to be crushed with this giant wave that's coming since the beginning of time. And I want to take you to the House of Abraham, where something so important happened that relates to now. In the House of Abraham, Sarah and Abraham, the patriarch, uh, have used Hagar, the maiden that was living in the house, to produce a child. Basically, you know, they, Abraham had sex with her, produced a child. This child became the ancestor of the Arabs and the Muslims after that. And when the Muslims go to the Hajj and go around the Kaaba and do all of these, the actions that they take that we call Hajj in Islam, they are reproducing, replaying, reenact, they are enacting, well, re reenacting, whatever that word is, the story of Hagar after she was thrown out uh, from the house of Abraham, she and her child, Ishmael. I, as a Palestinian, I look at that story and I see it's, it continues to be replayed. I'm being thrown out of Palestine, out of the house of Abraham. I'm not accepted. And even in America, you hear people saying, Judeo Christian tradition. Where is Islam? Where's Islam? The Hagar and Ishmael, where? It's Judeo, Christian, Islamic tradition, with all the beauty of this tradition and all the horror of this tradition. But nonetheless, we are in the house. So we're constantly being excluded. So yes, it is ethnic cleansing, genocidal, people killing other people that's coming from a long time through so many empires leading up to Europe, leading up to Palestine. And we have to be seen as part of humanity where this is happening to us and must, must be stopped as opposed to some small group, people of color, who it's okay for it to happen to them. We are part of humanity, the body of humanity, and this is happening to us. And it really needs to, to be stopped because we cannot change history, but we can stop it now. This is the way I see it. I see it from a very, very broad perspective as a human being because I refuse I refuse how they exclude me from humanity. I refuse. So I find all the ways that reintegrate me into humanity. And I must. And that's my responsibility and duty toward myself and toward of humanity, my mother, humanity. I'm sure she wants me. Thank you for the question. OK. Um, I'm very interested how you feel towards uh, the West Bank being inundated by the Jews, taking land and putting up apartment buildings and so on of Jewish settlements. Yes, I can uh, tell you how I feel, um, but I also can relate it to other uh, groups because, again, I don't want to really, I don't want to really isolate the Palestinians. I would feel like a Native American person felt when the white people inundated the land and it took over everything and renamed the cities and then sent people to uh, reservations where they are reserved there, whatever that word is, reservation. I mean, like, you know, their humanity is reserved. Um, or I feel like a black person who was enslaved because uh, effectively what's happening in Palestine is slavery. We can't travel without the Israelis saying yes. We can't eat. They can put us in um, a curfew for days, for weeks. They can stop the water from coming, and they do. Palestinians don't have water running uh, every day. The water that uh, the Palestinians find in the land under their houses or near their houses is taken out and sent to the Israeli uh, government where they can process it and, and sell us a little bit of it at a high cost. Well, see, this is a, a very important point. The, uh, the, uh, the human being named Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian human being named Mahmoud Abbas, some people see him as a president. I live in a democracy in the United States of America. I understand democracy from the perspective of America, right? Uh, the, the human being whose name is 
at some point in history was President Mahmoud Abbas, his presidency expired according to all uh, democratic uh, norms, right? So, and he hasn't been uh, re-elected um, democratically, you know, like in standard uh, procedures. He has not. So as a Palestinian, just out of respect for myself and out of a desire for uh, democracy for my people, not corrupted democracy, I do not really see that forcing the Palestinians to have Mahmoud Abbas as uh, their representative or any other human being is good for us as a people. There's nothing wrong with the person or any other person. But we do need, the, as a nation that's been crushed for so long, we do need the ideal of democracy where we elect someone, no matter how horrific this someone is, as you might know, like, you know, you can elect someone who really doesn't represent half of the population. But that is democracy. You put up with them for the time, for the four years, or you impeach them in ways that are in the Constitution, but you do not force the people to have a leader just because that leader pleases you. And what the Palestinians have now, we do not have representation of the people. We possibly have representation of a group of us, but we do not have a representation of the Palestinian people, and we need representation of the Palestinian people. And uh, the, the human being named Mahmoud Abbas, or you want to call him President Mahmoud, Mahmoud Abbas, is a completely fine Palestinian. I do not exclude any Palestinian personally, no matter what, even the traitors. For me, our people are our people. And every society includes so many different you know, uh, kinds of thinking, and that's OK. Diversity in good way or bad way, these are our people. But you're talking about leadership. It has norms, it has practices, and this has been destroyed for us because the United States and Israel decide who, who talks for us. If you ask the Palestinians who should be talking for them, most likely they would not choose uh, Mahmoud Abbas. So are you working towards a more representative spokesman for your people? Well, uh, what's happening is that I'm here speaking about an angle. There are many other people in different places speaking about other angles. We are basically bringing the story of our people to the world, not as a political uh, issue that can be put on agendas and maybe like a, uh, they'll decide about it in two years. It's a political issue. We're bringing it, at least for me, to the world as my people are dying and that needs to stop right now. It doesn't matter who represents me. It doesn't matter. My people need to live right now. You can negotiate for 20 years with anyone you like. But like while we drink coffee or we're eating or doing whatever we want to do, there are people who are dying. And that's really the real issue that I'd like to bring. It isn't a political issue. It is the people are dying. The children are not going to school. Um, nightmares, tremendous amount, generations of post-traumatic stress that is not post-traumatic. It's present traumatic. It doesn't end. You know, I've been arguing for years that Gaza should be where the leadership is arising. And you see that? The, the leadership should arise wherever it does arise. The people need to decide that. I will never hope or aim to decide where our leadership should be. The people decide an experiment. I mean, leadership is also a long-term experiment. Nations grow at leadership and representation. So we chose Hamas to lead us, okay? The people chose Hamas because Fatah was so corrupt, they chose Hamas. Okay, and then if, if you actually let people to, to, ex to discover what Hamas does, naturally the people would not choose Hamas next. Just like us, we have the Republicans, we have like the extreme uh, xenophobics, we have the, uh, an African-American president, etc. You are being educated throughout history at different ways of leadership. I can't like theorize that, oh, the Palestinians should be led like that. We have to explore and discover what kind of leadership leads to what kind of consequence. And we have to mature as a people at choosing our leaders. This shouldn't be imposed on us. We have to have the right to make our mistakes as well politically and through the democratic process. But that's not allowed because we are not seen as human beings. We're seen as lower human beings and you can choose leaders for us. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I'm perceptive. I happen to be that way. 
I really appreciate uh, the way you used education for your own uh, liberation. And uh, um, I, w I will be interested to know uh, how education is evolving now in, in, in Palestine. And uh, the other thing is about history. Uh, in your book and your presentation, uh, you made the point that uh, people have no access to history. Yes. Now, with the development of the internet, this is this my uh, kind of curiosity. Yeah. Are uh, young people in Palestine have access now to, to their whole history? Well, the internet is, of course, um, the internet is the internet. And you don't really know what is accurate history and what's uh, a fake history. For instance, a huge number of websites that their name is Palestine are done by the Israelis to give you their viewpoint. But you'd think that you're actually reading a, a website on Palestine. I mean, this is like a strategy. This is uh, their strategy of keeping their narrative, the dominant one, and keeping the Palestinian voice out. I don't blame them. This is what they want to accomplish, and they're doing it. But as far as the Palestinians, um, b what I keep coming back to, which is extremely important to me from my personal experience as a Palestinian, history for us is very painful. It's probably as painful as it is to you white people in this room to look at the history. I mean, for you, it'd be really hard to see that you've enslaved people and you've done genocide, and what am I going to do about this? Um, it, for me, as a Palestinian, it's like, what am I going to do about this? This has happened, and we've been crushed, and we lost this and lost that, and we're not represented. What am I going to do about this? So emotionally, for a Palestinian child to begin to study about the loss after loss after loss, is, it turns you off. You want to read some things that are hopeful as to balance out your history, and we don't have that because we haven't written our history yet. I have some of those here. Like you can really enjoy finding big moments of being Palestinian here, and you need that. You can't, you can't have our history the way they wrote it for us, the historians, whether it's Europeans or Jewish or so, some other, telling us that we... We're just, we don't have what other people have. The resilience or the strength of spirit or the spunk or the um, whatever it takes to be uh, happy to belong to your group. Now, what is necessary for the Arab and for the, the Palestinian in particular is to go so far and to find really ancient roots where no one can deny your belonging to a great uh, people, such as our contribution, you know, like to the Arab numbers. These are Arab numbers, everybody uses them, for instance, the uh, logarithms that people use for computers. This is all the Muslim Arab thinking. It wasn't just really the Arabs, it was the Arabs during Islam when they opened up to all nations and therefore embraced, just like America does now, embraced everyone into their culture. This openness of a culture that, that People started to study Arabic. If they wanted to do science and to um, explore and contribute, they had to study Arabic. The universities taught in Arabic. So Europeans had to study Arabic to do anything, just like I studied English in order to do anything now. Uh, and so that the Arab or the, the Palestinian or the Muslim in, in general, they have to go to a place where they had a very good, positive relationship with life before too much damage had happened and see what qualities produce that and carry them to the present time. And I do that in my life. My ancestors, I, I think of my ancestors as uh, the, uh, from Emir al Qais in literature, my ancestor. I claim people who came like, you know, um, centuries ago, I claim them as my grandparents. I don't like say, oh, this ancient poet. No, I say I'm the, the granddaughter of Al-Mutanabi and Emir al Qais and um, the Ibn Sina and Arazi. These are my grandparents. And I sit to write with this knowledge that they are my grandparents. Terrible things have happened to our people, but these are my grandparents too. So I go at it from this place of hopefulness, knowing that we can do a lot. And I find every word that in English, and there are a ton of words in English, that come from Arabic. Whether it's alcohol. You have alcohol from us, by the way. So remember us when you drink. Um, sugar. You know, if you love your sugar and chocolate, coffee, 
Yep, this is all Arabic. Um, yeah, <laughs> it is that too. So much in Arabic. Uh, of course, the Arabic numbers, the zero, the value, that without it, you couldn't really do commerce or, 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 or do very much, or computer science, the binary, you have zero, one, etc. So if we take the, the child to see that uh, there was a time when things were right in their relationship with the world, um, but it doesn't have, but, but there's a necessity of you exploring that not just in one way. Because during that time, when there was greatness for the Arabs and the Muslims and Palestinians, etc., there was also oppression coming from us toward others. We were on top, and this has to be negotiated and to leave that other side. You see what I'm saying? So I feel that we are responsible for our cultures, to sift them. Every generation has to sift the cultures and take what's good forward and let go what's destructive, just let it go for the health. You know, it's like you do a, an annual uh, exam or you check yourself uh, to see where you are. Uh, the, every culture has to check itself where it is. If there are tendencies that are rising that are destructive for itself or for others, like racism or sexism or uh, colonialism or all of these isms, these are uh, severe illnesses that kill millions of people. If not your people, other people. These illnesses need to be cured. And then there are amazing tendencies that take to science, take to knowledge, take to art, and take us forward. These need to be strengthened. So every culture needs to, neg to negotiate this way. And what is a culture but the children and the students and you and me? Wh wh what is a culture but us? Constantly sifting and finding what's really beautiful in our cultures and in one another's culture and helping it so our lives can be better. And what's really um, destructive and unhealthy and trying to heal it together and having an honest conversation about it. What is, what is our lives but that anyway? Thank you so, so very much for this inspiring talk. Uh, I definitely agree with you uh, with regard to uh, our need uh, at the micro and the macro levels. Speaking of Palestine or the Arabs or you know, every other people, uh, first to stop the killing right now. Uh, my question is, how do we do that? That's number one, at the micro level. At the macro level, in the, the medium term and the long term, I hear you saying, and I, I do subscribe to that, is that it is high time that thanks to the democratization of information and the revolution of communication through the internet, uh, that we actually invent a new vision Yes. That is uplifting. Yes. And that vision is actually to liberate the human mind. That's right. And the human heart. Yes. From all the baggage that actually keeps us slaves. That's it. The slavery. We do have, we are slaves actually. Pretty and much. then once we do that, I think through awareness and consciousness and work to liberate the human spirit, we can perhaps uh, attain a new humanism, which we should should be a new program, for, for that we can talk and and ask every human being to adopt. Maybe that's the way for renewal, for societal transformation, starting by the individual. I don't know what you think of that. But what I think is, uh, at this time, you can see the slavery. You can see it. You can see people in America completely enslaved to foods, to drugs, to alcohol, to violence. People in America, there's a, um, there's a, a pretense that people are free in America. Maybe they are free from the domination of other nations, but they are not free uh, of the slavery of what they do to themselves in order to avoid thinking, feeling, facing major issues. So there are different kinds of slaveries, right? I mean, things that make you act in, against your will and against your good. And I see America everywhere I go. I mean, this is, there's an epidemic of people killing themselves. 
like the number one killer of white men who are the most privileged people in this country is suicide. Now, what makes a person commit suicide? I mean, there's something on the inside that's going on. There's an immense amount of suffering that requires a lot of empathy. This is a, a group with all the privileged killing themselves. What are we going to do? <laughs> what should we do? See what I'm saying? There's a, this conversation have, hasn't happened. And I do believe that with the privilege of uh, white men in general comes, or men, or any group, comes isolation so that you can maintain your privilege. In the isolation, you pay the price of that privilege, and it's lethal. Because the human being is a social being that needs to be connected with others and needs others. So what appears to be privilege is actually a deadly condition. And I believe this happens as a woman, because my perspective is as a woman, and it can never be a, not a woman's perspective. This is who I am. The world treats me as a woman. I'm constitutionally a woman. I'm this part of humanity that sees the world as who I am. It, it's the feeling. It's the robbing the human child who's male, and now female too, but male, from their feeling, which is their compass of how, they, how they're doing on the inside. So you really don't know. You go into the world not knowing what's happening to you on the inside. You're robbed. You don't have that compass. So the society tells you what it is to be a good man, and you go ahead and do it. And you discover later on that that was a terrible lie, that you would do anything, and you pay all your money in order to regain your ability to feel and your joy of childhood before you were robbed. As a woman, I'm a bit lucky with all the losses. I'm a bit lucky that people devalued my feelings and let me have them. <laughs> it's just like, oh, you know, <laughs> this is women feeling. And it turns out this is really where like a, an amazing breathing place that liberates my mind. Because if you don't feel your feelings, then all of this piles up in front of your thinking and your mind. And the mind becomes very preoccupied about what to do about this feeling. But if the mind tells the feeling, go ahead and be expressed, then the mind is free to do its work. And this women know. And that's why women live longer. I think we have one uh, time for one more question here. All right, I'll take one more question. Oh, thanks for your talk. It was really powerful and moving. And um, I just want to maybe get your reaction to something that you say that Palestinians are being excluded from humanity. I, I don't want to misrepresent what you're saying. Yes, they I, are. I, yeah, yeah I, and I agree. And I just, what is your, this is happening now in spite of all the international law and all the, you know, International Court of Justice and the Security Council resolutions and all the principles that the United States and the EU and other places say that they stand for, you know, this occupation is happening and these violations are taking place and it's, it's total impunity. And, you know, I was on the ground in Palestine for most of the summer, and, y and you go to these places, Belin and Susia and um, Nabi Sala, and you hear, you know, how bad things are on the ground, and there's a huge disconnect, actually, between how bad it is there on the ground and then maybe here. Um, and, I mean, I'm just wondering, um, how do you react then to that, that um, the, you know, just the U.S. is, is acting against their own principles and values and stated. Yeah, but see, I, I, as a person and as a woman, as a writer, as a poet, as an artist, etc., I don't go to the politics to say, oh, the U.S. is acting against its interests. What is the U.S. interest? It's like the political interest? That doesn't matter to me. I don't give a damn. What I care about is the interest of the human being who lives in America, or the human being who lives there, etc., not the political systems. But that's enshrined in those principles. But, uh, But, see, when people talk about American interests, it's like, okay, well, uh, we're losing money uh, on this enterprise, etc. But let me just tell you what, what I think. I think that the United States has been created by the founding fathers as a country that when the immigrants come here, they disconnect from the rest of the world. They disconnect from their heritages. You become American, and you're supposed to stop thinking and caring about the world. Otherwise, like you would have this dual affiliation or dual loyalty, you, you just have to become American. And that has harmed the American people greatly. 
because they had to cut off the roots. This harmed the American people greatly because if we actually open up our roots to in America, we would care about everyone in the world. We wouldn't harm anyone here in America. Now, there is a, a pile up of history that hasn't been negotiated in America. And there's a pile up of history that hasn't been negotiated for the Jewish people. They have like a, a giant mountain of history that creates fear in them. The people in, in Israel are immensely afraid. I mean, all these guns and uh, all this um, vigilance comes from an immense amount of fear. They are incapable, for the most part, like especially the government, of seeing the Palestinians or seeing anyone. They, they just, all they see is their history and fear and their, there's this uh, possibility of them getting annihilated, another Holocaust happening, etc. They are very obsessed. And this is a, the mental state of a whole nation that they need to negotiate. No one can do it for them. They need to do this for their own good, their own survival, and their own healing to see that really things ha have changed. There, there is a room for healing for them, and they can contribute to the healing of others. For me as a Palestinian, I am left with the leadership, the kind of leadership that must. It's not like exactly my choice, that's what I would do um, if I left on my own. But I must, in order to accomplish my freedom and the stopping of the killing of my people, to understand the history of the Jewish people and what's happening to them, and have great empathy with what's happening to them in order to kind of understand the situation and find solutions because they are not willing to find the solutions. It has to come from me and understand what's happening in America, the different groups, where are the possible openness, where is the hope, and where is the difficulty. It's left to me because I, as a Palestinian, stand in a place where my life depends on it. My life depends on understanding the Jews and the Americans and everybody who's involved in this oppression of us and now because it's been like this I take it as a gift from the world I take it as a gift from the world that I am asked to learn about everyone to open up to empathize to be as creative immensely creative to embrace the entire world not just my people in order to arrive at a possibility of a solution for my people and I accept that's all I could tell you Thank you very much, to Sam. And Thank please, you so uh, much for inviting me. You're very welcome. Please don't forget to grab a copy of the book. Yes, on your I'll way sign out. books now. Thank you. <laughs>